All right, today we're going to talk about cell transport, types of diffusion, and um, types of solutions, and something called active transport. Okay, so passive transport is the movement of materials across the cell membrane without using any sort of energy. So that means that's what passive means. It just kind of happens naturally. Um, so if you're looking at cells, they all live in some sort of liquid environment. So um, the cells in your body obviously are in a liquid-based environment. Um, so one of the most important functions of a cell membrane is to regulate what's going in and out of the cell by keep so it can keep the internal conditions relatively constant, which is homeostasis, keeping things in balance. Um, so it does this by pre, um, regulating what type you know move the movement of molecules from one side of the membrane to the other whether it's from outside to inside the cell or the other way inside to outside the cell so diffusion um, so in the cytoplasm of the cell you have different substances that are dissolved in water um, so for example maybe like glucose um, that's dissolved in your cytoplasm and and so in any solution the solute which is the part that gets dissolved, um, the solute particles tend to move from an area of high to low concentration. So that's the idea of diffusion. Diffusion is just the idea that um, things naturally want to move from a high concentration to a lower concentration area. Um, so diffusion is the driving force behind the movement of many substances across the cell membrane. So here's a picture um, where we have a cell that's present in um, an unequal concentration on the other side, so it's more concentrated. We have more solute particles on the outside than the inside. So diffusion causes a net movement of the solute particles that are able to go through the cell membrane here. They're small. Um, from the side of the membrane with the higher concentration, so more are going into the cell um, to an area to inside this area where it's lower. So it's going from a high area of concentration of solute to low. There are some going outside because we have kind of a, a movement back and forth, but the net movement, we have more solutes, solute con um, particles moving into the cell because it's less concentrated inside the cell. Eventually equilibrium is um, reached, which is when the concentration on both sides of your membrane is equal or the same. So movement is going to keep on, is going to continue to happen, um, but it's going to continue in a way where there's no change in the concentration. So it'll kind of randomly keep going until you know, with um, keeping equilibrium um, happening. So again, the particles in the solution will continue to move across the membrane in both directions. Um, because almost equal numbers of particles move in each direction, there's no net change in the concentration. So we're going to maintain equilibrium. Um, diffusion also depends on the random particle movement. So substances diffuse across membranes without requiring the cell to use additional energy. So the movement of materials across the cell membrane, again, without using any sort of energy, is called passive transport. So diffusion without energy needed, it happens passively. It happens on its own. Okay, so an example of this, tying back to the circulatory system, is how oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged um, throughout from your circulatory system to the alveoli. Um, so yeah, oxygen carbon dioxide are exchanged across the walls of the alveoli and the capillaries. Um, chemical properties of the blood and red blood cells specifically allow for the efficient transport of these gases. So what happens here, when air enters the alveoli, okay, um, oxygen dissolves in the moisture on their inner surface and then diffuses across the capillary walls. So here, oxygen's going from the, here's one alveolus, diffuses into the red blood cell. So oxygen diffuses in the direction, this particular direction, because oxygen is more concentrated right now in the alveolus and less concentrated in the red blood cell. So naturally, the oxygen molecules will diffuse from the high concentrated area of your alveolus to the low concentration area of your red blood cell. Same idea um, with carbon dioxide. So why does it go into your alveolus? So here um, in the red blood cell, when it's low oxygenated red blood cells, um, we have a high concentration of carbon dioxide that's going to naturally passively move into the alveolus, which is a low concentration of carbon dioxide. So this idea of diffu diffusion from high to low is key for how your circulatory system and respiratory system interact. 
So diffusion of oxygen from the alveoli into capillaries is a passive transport or passive process that happens on its own without energy that stops when oxygen concentration is in the blood and alveoli are the same. So when we reach that equilibrium point, then um, the process stops. Facilitated diffusion, um, so for cell membranes, that have proteins that act as carriers or channels make it easy for molecules to move across. So molecules that cannot directly diffuse across the plasma membrane because they may be too large or um, they're polarized, um, they'll use protein channels for this process facilitate diffusion. So facilitate, to facilitate something means to help. Um, so hundreds of different proteins have been found that allow particular substances to cross the cell membranes. Um, this does not require any energy, it's just you have this kind of helper protein that kind of helps give a bigger area for bigger molecules to go in and out of the cell and to, um, to let polarized molecules that, or ions that would be usually repelled by the hydro um, or the nonpolar tails of the plasma membrane. These proteins allow them for a safe passage. So for example of facilitated diffusion here with osmosis, um, which is the movement of water across the membrane, um, the inside of the cell's lipid bilayer is hydrophobic, so it's water hating, it repels water. Because of this, water molecules have a tough time passing through the cell membrane because it would be repelled. So there's um, many cells contain these channels called aquaporins, so like aqua, like water, like agua and porin like a pore, so a water pore, um, that allows water to pass through right through them. Without aquaporins, water would not easily diffuse into a cell in and out. Um, so the movement of water through cell membranes by facilitated diffusion is an extremely important biological process, which is osmosis. So speaking of osmosis, um, osmosis is, um, it's like diffusion, but it's just specifically for water. So osmosis is the involves the movement of water molecules from an area of high concentration of water to an area of low concentration of water. So how osmosis works. So in this experiment here, we have a barrier right here that's permeable to water, but not to sugar. So the sugar are the green dots here. This means that water molecules can pass through the barrier, so water can flow in and out throughout this barrier, but the sugar, the solute, cannot. So on the left side here, we have a lower concentration of sugar molecules, less green dots. On the right side, we have a higher concentration of sugar molecules, which are, again, the green dots. So what's going to happen here is water, or th it's going to, there's going to be water movement until equal, there's equal concentrations, concentration of s sugar molecules on both sides of the membrane. So we're going to be using these aquaporins. So there are more sugar molecules on the right than on the left. Um, therefore, the concentration of water is lower on the right compared to the concentration of water on the left. Oops, okay. Um, so what we're going to see here, there, there's going to be a net movement of water into the compartment um, that contains the more concentrated sugar solution. So water is going to flow from the left side to the right side because water is going from an area of low water to high water, or you can think of it that the water is going to dilute the higher concentrated sugar side so that both sides will have an equal amount of solute to water molecules on both sides of this barrier. So water will tend to move across the barrier until equilibrium is reached. At that point, the concentrations of water and sugar will be the same on both sides. So notice here the water is higher up because you need more water per solute molecule on the right side compared to the left. So the ratios are the same now, comparatively speaking, with water molecules and these sugar molecules. So now um, they're equal concentrations of sugar molecules. So when the concentration is the same on both sides um, the, of the membrane, the two solutions are called isotonic. So it means same strength. So iso means equal or same. So isosceles triangle, triangle with two equal sides, iso. Um, the more concentrated sugar side right here is known as a hypertonic solution. So the prefix hyper means high. Um, so you have more sugar molecules. You're more concentrated, you're hypertonic. Left side here, you are hypotonic. So the prefix hypo means low um, or below. 
So here you have less sugar molecules um, compared to the right, so you are hypotonic, you're lower concentrated on the left. Um, osmotic pressure, um, just a side note, so for organisms to survive they must have um, a way to balance the intake and loss of water. So the net movement of water out or into the cell exerts a force known as osmotic pressure. So this comes into play when you put different cells in um, different types of solutions, isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. Um, this, because the cell is filled with salts, sugar, and protein, and other molecules, it always, um, it almost always um, is hypertonic to fresh water. So fresh water has no other things besides water in it. So since inside the cells we have all these other things dissolved in it, cells technically are hypertonic compared to fresh water. Fresh water would be hypotonic to cells. As a result, water will tend to move quickly into the cell to um, dilute the area inside the cell that has all these things dissolved in it. Um, so water will rush into these cells um, and it will cause the cell to um, the cell to swell and may and um, eventually the cell may burst. So if you're an animal cell, the cell membrane can only withhold a certain amount of water. After that point, it lyses, it breaks. The um, plant cell wall keep, um, can kind of hold in all that water in the vacuole so the cell becomes turgid or like firm. Um, okay. So in plants, again, yeah, so I just went through this, the turgid cell wall. Um, so most, since most cells in large organisms do not come in contact with fresh water, there are not really any danger of bursting. The only time you have to worry about that is um, when you get a saline IV. It has to be a certain percentage so we don't have this risk of introducing a hypotonic solution into um, with your cells. So um, instead, the cells are bathed in fluids such as blood that are isotonic and have concentrations of dissolved materials roughly equal to those inside the cell. So cells placed in an isotonic solution neither gain nor lose water because we have equal concentrations on both sides. When you place a cell in a hypertonic solution, um, outside is more concentrated in solute, so the water is going to rush out of the cell to do um, dilute that area outside so that it'll eventually become isotonic or equal concentration to what's inside the cell. So because of that, um, your cell walls or your cells will shrink. So here the animal cells crenated or shrinks and then in this um, plant cell the vacuole shrinks and you become plasmalized. So other cells, including those of plants and bacteria that come into contact with fresh water, are surrounded by a tough cell wall to prevent from, um, again, from expanding. You'll get just kind of that turgid, firm look. Um, again, and when you have an animal cell that's put in a hypotonic solution, so a low concentrated solution, um, water is going to go into the cell, which is more hypertonic, and can cause that um, cell to burst, so it can reach equilibrium, so that would not be good. Okay, active transport. Um, this is the movement of material against a concentration difference, and you need energy. Um, so cells sometimes must move materials against a concentration difference. Um, the movement of material against a concentration difference is known as active transport. So active transport of um, small molecules or ions across a cell membrane is generally carried out by the transport proteins or protein pumps that are found in the membrane itself. So we have, again, another, like, some proteins that help um, different molecules um, go through the plasma membrane. So larger molecules and clumps of materials can also be actively transported across the cell by a process known as endocytosis, so endo means into, and exocytosis. So here's endocytosis, um, where your cell forms like a pocket around the material and forms a vesicle and it kind of swallows up this whole bit to be distributed throughout the cell. Exocytosis is the opposite, where you have a big um, kind of package that's put around the substance you're trying to get out of the cell, and it kind of just spits it out. So um, there's like a vesicle that helps carry this big um, molecule out of the cell. So the transport of these larger materials sometimes involves changes in the shape of the cell membrane. Okay, we're going to continue on on the next um, slideshow, just a couple more slides to go. Okay.